Okay, let's get started on today's webinar session covering the most commonly asked marketing questions that plague accountants. Now joining me today are Tom Wilson, Director of Better Marketing Results and Viv Brownrigg, Co-Founder, Director of Marketing and Strategic Partnerships of The Gap. Hi guys. Hello. Hi. Great to be here. Fantastic. Well, I'm very excited to get into this. Now before we hit on to your questions, I thought I would just take about two minutes to just run through your pre-work. And the point here is to really uncover and provide you with some insights into what some of your peers and colleagues in the accounting space are doing when it comes to their marketing activity, hopefully give you a feeling for where you fit and maybe some encouragement. So kicking things off in terms of the biggest marketing challenges. So time, as always, was on nearly everyone's uh, responses. Time to do it, time in terms of, uh, you know, there's so much else on your plates and, you know, where does one find the time to do marketing? How does one even view marketing within your firm? Um, another one was very much around finding and targeting the right types of clients. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more in, uh, in today's session. Then acquiring new clients, always a uh, something that's top of mind for people. Uh, and some of the questions actually directly deal with a client acquiring new clients. The next biggest one was content. So this is content on websites, on emails, on social posts. You know, what should I be writing about? How do I write about it? Um, or I'm not a very good writer. And, you know, where do I source it from? And it's, it could be expensive. So that's, again, something we'll deal with. Consistency. Oftentimes, finding that consistency to do marketing is challenging. We know that you guys are busy. There's a lot of other things that you have on your plates day to day servicing clients. So consistency is another one that we'll touch on. Cost and budget. So this might be cost in terms of doing paid activity. This might be a, events or you know ads, or it might just be the cost within your own organization. You know how do I allocate? Um, some budget towards a resource within my organization, or maybe it's an external resource who is going to be doing the marketing for me. Now, that leads directly into having the capacity and the resources. You know, again, in this particular market, you know, finding good people to join your firm um, and have them be able to uh, cover maybe not only the job that you initially hired them for, but maybe doing, you know, having the wherewithal to do some marketing, you know, could be another question. And then everyone's favorite, social media. It's a bit of a, a bugbear for many people, but it is very necessary. And um, again, we've got some answers to some of your questions on, you know, why social media um, is, can be such an important channel for you. So going into rating your current marketing efforts out of five, and thank you so much for um, being so forthcoming with your answers. There are only a few people who, uh, who didn't sort of answer these. So fantastic that you all felt able to share. Now, interestingly, quite a large number read themselves as lower than two out of five, so about 42%. Um, so hopefully today's session will help give you some ideas to lift yourselves up that rating ranks. 36% felt that they were probably three out of five. And again, I'm not sure if that's uh, just being happy to sort of choose three out of five because you might be doing some things well, maybe other things not so well. So again, hopefully we'll give you some ideas to maybe get you up in that four or five rate rating. And obviously look, there are some, some of you out there who are doing great things. And so we applaud you for your efforts and obviously great that you still wanted to come along today and hopefully we can add some value to you as well. Now, lastly, uh, how do you measure marketing ROI? And it seems like it's a straightforward question a third of you said you do know how to measure it, two thirds said you don't, but there were some interesting qualifiers um, in, in many of your answers. So on the yes side, you know, it was like, yes, I do know how to do it, but I don't have the process in place to measure it. Or my consultant does this, or I leave it to the marketing team. So even though you may not know how to do it, your team does. Another one said, I know the theory, you know, but maybe we're not doing it. On the other side, in terms of not doing it, or they don't know how to do it, um, never tried, or no goals have been set, or we don't do it because we just rely on word of mouth. So we will address some of your questions on ROI. And to that, let's get into the questions. So Viv, can I um, let you lead off on these? Sure, great. Um, and great for that everyone did that pre-work. It's um, really helped us in, in um, shaping the content for this session. Uh, so first question, uh, very common question, uh, where is the time best spent uh, for 
minimal cost. Now, the first thing I'm going to say, I'm just going to kick off here. The first thing I'm going to say is that this is a very common question, and uh, it, it's a bit of a contentious question, actually, because a lot of firms actually regard marketing as an overhead. I'm just going to get that out there, because I know some of you are thinking it, so I'll, I'll just say it. Uh, and when you think about it, marketing is not an overhead, it's an investment. It's an investment in good quality clients. It's also an investment in retention. So let's not forget that marketing is also about retaining your existing clients, your best clients, and getting more clients like your best clients. So if, if we focus just on minimal cost, we're not going to get a return. Because you'll try something once, you expect to get a, a, you know, a hit immediately, you don't get that hit. Uh, and then marketing gets consigned to the overhead rubbish bin and you don't do it again. Uh, and so I want to, want to turn this around and maybe think about what is the lifetime value of one of your clients? How long do they stay with you? If they're spending four and a half grand with you right now per year and they're on average staying with you for nine years, then that's more than $40,000 $40, in terms of lifetime value. So um, let's start thinking about the lifetime value of, of a client and maybe we'll focus a little less on that word minimal spend. But Tom, I know you want to add some things here as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think from the perspective of, you know, we like to, uh, you know, for accountants, obviously we're all accountants here. So people thinking, you know, if you have a client come on board that was asking this question, you'd be thinking, this is going to be, this is going to be tough. You know, you know, that the people that get the best value out of your services that you work with from an accounting perspective are the ones that engage with you and take your advice most and are ready to invest to get that return. So, I mean, you could go all the way down the scale for this. If I mean, even if you said, you know, well, what is the, the best way that costs me nothing to go and get uh, return on investment for marketing well go to the local coffee store and listen to what your clients complain about after a meeting that's free you could go do that but you know if you you're not going to get that much out of that if you kind of go up the value chain and go well I'm focusing on as Viv said lifetime value of the client and if I'm going to get 40 grand of this client in the next nine or ten years what am I prepared to spend to acquire that and then can I scale that out to get long-term growth for my business and it's all about scale I think when it comes to that best spend for minimal cost. You build systems, processes, and you get better returns off them over time, which of course requires consistency, which I'm sure will come up as a theme later in this as well. So I just wanted to add that, I think. Brilliant. And we are going to, we're, we're going to talk about some strategies that actually don't have a big spend attached to them. So hopefully you'll come out of this session uh, thinking about where you're going to spend your time without investing large amounts of money so I guess it's um what does that uh, that word minimal actually mean well we're not talking about investing tens and tens of thousands of dollars here it's actually quite the reverse but I think um unless you want to add something Charles we'll um we'll uh, get into the next question I'm just going to jump in I'm just going to quickly take over sharing my screen for a little while I think Charles might have some technical difficulties so I'm yep. just going Thank to you. that here we go all right. Can everyone see my screen now? There we, we can. Go. Thanks, Tom. So we'll go to the next question. Here. Okay. So, um, great question. How do I avoid price-driven um, inquiries? Um, now, this is very interesting because it does come down to your brand and what you stand for and what your purpose is, which should come across loud and clear in, in your web presence, particularly your website, but everything that you do um, electronically, including social uh, media. So uh, if you, for example, when we were chatting about this before we kicked off the session, uh, you don't go into Gucci to get things on sale, do you? So you're not going to come to an accounting firm who clearly is uh, looking for clients that want to engage and invest in accounting, specialist tax, business advisory services, um, if, th if you don't actually want those things. So you've got to make sure that your presence is really clear in terms of who you work for and who you don't work for. And there is a number of things you can do on your web presence. For example, if you've got a, uh, a web inquiry form, put a couple of questions in there, which will help um, pre-qualify people. In fact, they probably won't complete the form. So you might ask the question like, why are you looking to change accountants? And of course, 
it's pretty unlikely they're going to put, well, I just want to shave 30% off my accounting spend. Um, or you might ask some questions about what their goals are in business, what their aspirations are, what they're hoping to achieve. Um, that That's probably not going to attract your tie kickers. And then if you're dealing with um, phone inquiries and email inquiries, you might think of four or five simple screening questions that you will ask to um, to kick those people out of the game, if you like. Birds of a feather, a feather flock together. So the better you get at this in your web presence and, and by asking screening questions, the less likely over time you will attract these targets. Yeah, big time. I'll, I'll just, I'll just uh, add in on that is that is also another way that you can spend less time and get better results because how many t people here have wasted time with clients that have led you on for long and long, you know, all along and then kind of go, these were never an ideal client for me. Um, and processes are the answer, exactly as Viv said. Even if someone does phone into you, um, you know, if you have um, a gatekeeper that answers the phone, they can have these questions that they also run through before that client gets to you. And if the person is clearly not interested in value adding to their business, then you, you know, you can decide whether you want to whether you want to engage with that or how you want to deal with that. And obviously, you've got to do that politely and nicely. But there is certainly processes you can put around that that'll save you infinite time in the future. It'll just save you every time a tire kicker gives you a call. And as Viv said, uh, putting that on form is an even easier way of doing that to pre-qualify people that come through the door. Brilliant, Tom. And Charles, anything you want to add there? Uh, no, I mean, I think you guys have covered it. I'm, but I can't wait for the, uh, for the next question. Okay, we'll kick right into it then. Okay, and the next Something question, that across. slide is coming up. Um, okay, what is something unique that a small number of accountants are doing? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with you, Charles. I've got a couple of things I want to say, but I want to hear. Cool. Well, look, from, from a marketing perspective, um, you know, purely from that lens, I think the ones where we've seen real success uh, is when they are consistent with their marketing and they view it as, a, uh, as an activity which they, they plan for and they undertake. And they understand that, like all good uh, plans, it will take time to build. Um, and then, you know, you can't expect just to sort of switch it on and off. You need to sort of invest in it, you know, whether it's those internal resources or a little bit of budget and, um, and then basically keep it on and keep it going. And as you go, make sure that you're measuring it. So measuring the ROI and, and then equally, um, you know, reporting back on it. So, you know, at the end of six months or a year, you know, look back at it, see how, see how, uh, how to, how it um, achieved against your initial plan goals, and then you can tweak it. So, you know, did certain things work less or well better than you had thought of that you expected, uh, and then you can obviously make those changes. So, again, that consistency would be one thing that I see. Um, the accounts who really do well with their marketing, that's that's what we see. Fantastic, Tom. Yeah, I mean, I think that follows that whole sort of shiny object law. You know, it's the same in, in every area of business. If you keep trying to chase the newest marketing strategy you, you've heard of or some little thing that you think is going to bring you lots of clients really quickly, and believe me, there's a lot of marketers out there telling you that they have that system for you, um, then you just spread yourself too thin, try too many different things and you exhaust yourself. But as Charles said, consistency is key. Set a plan stick to it just like a good budget like i'm sure we all tell our clients we have um, you stick to your budget and then you'll get the best results for cash flow um so i think that is really really key and the other thing i've seen accountants do really well and i think um viv was mentioning this before and she probably has something to say about it too but is um is asking for referrals and also developing reviews for your services online there's a big disconnect between someone who finds you even if they've been referred to you and them actually picking up the phone and calling you. So bridging that across with some reviews, referrals, um, and sort of like online uh, reviews people can find is sometimes just the little kick over the line that they need to get in contact with you. You might already be getting referred a lot of clients that you just never hear about because when they search for your business, three other businesses show up with maybe better reviews. And so you might actually be losing clients you're already being referred. So that's something that a small number of accountants do really well is get their reviews up online and bridge that gap. Beautiful, Tom. I, there you go. Again, and I think you put in our Facebook group a few months back, uh, what would happen if you had 100 plus Google reviews? Wouldn't that be phenomenal? So 
one thing done really well, and some other things are going to come up in the next few questions. So we'll just move uh, move things along to the next question if we can. Yep, no problems. Okay, so news, media, where do we draw the line as to what to post, not post? I'm going to hand this one over to you, Charles. Thanks. Well, I think it's always a good starting point to think about your end reader, your end audience. You know, who, who are you trying to engage? Who are you trying to target? And then think about the content that is going to be relevant for them. So if you're trying to reach, say, tradies as a, maybe a subgroup of, of uh, potential clients, you know, what is going to be relevant and interesting to them? Now, in terms of, you know, finding that content, you know, you might then go and look on, you know, in the trade sections of, of magazines or newspapers that you follow. You might even sign up to some uh, big trade um, sort of focused software platforms. And then, you know, you'll find things that are going to be interesting to them. You know, equally, if you're wanting to sort of reach farmers or business professionals, again, you know, think about what's going to be relevant for them. The nice thing on social media is that, you can, you know, because you can post often, um, you can hit multiple different uh, audiences with your with your posts, especially if you use hashtags. So if you put sort of hashtags trade or hashtags sort of, um, you know, uh, business professional or SME, you'll be able to sort of help them find you through the use of those hashtags. Now, one thing I would definitely, I suppose, sound a note of caution on is, you know, the, the red, uh, the third line of, of of social posts and that's really anything to do with politics would be a very easy one um and an example of this is you know we're going through an election process um no no post about any sort of personal politics is ever going to go down well you know you may or may not like something that you read um don't feel free to sort of share that out your personal views with everyone if you however have an interesting insight into a policy and how it might affect some of your readers or your clients, well, that is interesting. So again, it's using a bit of common sense, thinking what is going to be relevant and what is going to be interesting to them and balance that against, you know, uh, making sure that, you know, after all, you are a professional yourself with a professional reputation to maintain. And I suppose, like anything, just thinking about what would be appropriate to post. Yes, and we, we never know what our clients' views are on, on certain matters, do we? Uh, unless mm. we? Unless we know them incredibly well. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll move it along. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so the next question, uh, does anyone read our blogs and newsletters? I don't, I know I don't read the ones I receive. Are they effective as I'm not seeing their fruits? I'm just going to make a comment here. Uh, and then I know that that Charles and Tom will want to uh, interject here. Look, you, you don't get uh, marketing results from one single strategy usually or one single channel or one campaign. Sometimes it's five touch points across multiple channels and campaigns that gets a new client across the line or engages an existing client to work more closely with you. Uh, so... Uh, you know, it's a don't don't diss your blogs and newsletters just because you're not getting any feedback. I recall a few years ago when uh, an accounting firm that I was coaching said this very thing to me, and I said, "Well, why don't you go and ask your clients? Let's survey them." Got a decent response for it, right? Put a, a little prize out there, and we got a lot of comments saying, "Yeah, I, I, I do read your newsletters and I like them." So they're not going to go and like and sort of send you accolades. They might be just quietly digesting what you're sending. So don't diss them, but making sure you've got good targeted content of interest is really important. So moving beyond just generic content becomes very important. And on this, this subject, I'm going to hand over to Charles. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I would, I suppose, um, Add, add on to that and also add on to what we said in the previous one, you know, think about your target audience and think about the end reader. You know, the nice thing with newsletters, especially, is that you can um, target them to subsections of your overall client base or your database. You know, you don't have to do the old spray and pray. One email goes to everything on all topics. You know, uh, if you've got something to talk about, um, you know, make sure that you then go into um, your email program or software uh, and then basically segment your audience and so say great I've got 
um, some really fascinating, insightful uh, content to share to my directors, my director clients, just send it to them. You know, there's no point sending it to non-directors, for example, because it's not going to be relevant to them. So again, making sure it's relevant to them is key. On your blog side of things, you know, this really comes into, I suppose, Tom's sphere with the, with the website tracking. But, you know, just very briefly, make sure they're optimized for SEO and make sure that your website overall um, is doing as good a job as it can in terms of keywords. And actually, this little bit answers your question, Martha, um, in terms of, uh, you know, do you ever, you know, do you market something based on location, i.e. being local or industries? On your website and in your blogs, you're, you can do both. Um, and Tom, you might want to talk about this in a bit more detail. Yeah, well, what I might do is I've just pulled up here on screen share and I'll pull it over here at Google Analytics. If people have kind of Google Analytics installed, it takes five minutes to install. It's very easy. And see here, you can actually, and I just pulled up an example, break down, I'm not sure if everyone can see that, all the different pages on your website, how many people visit that page, how, how many times they have visited that page in the last 30 or 60 days or whatever you set and how long they spent on those pages. So a direct answer to that question, do people read my blogs? You can set up for free and install in five minutes. And a good example here is here's one for, uh, what's this page on here for zero training. So that's a blog that 30 odd people, I think see roughly each month, spend 22 seconds on that. And then where that then connects, I'll just pull that off the screen now, where that connects is then if you're asking your clients, um, how did you find out about us? Or if they fill in a particular contact form on a particular page, then you'll know what blog did they read and where did they come through to us. And the answer, you know, you can set up pretty tricky things that you can even have contact forms that tell you which page the person was on when they came in, then got in contact with you. Um, so you can set some really, really creative things up that don't actually take that much time to get the tracking in place. And a lot of people don't have that set up. But yeah, that's all I want to say on that one. Brilliant. Are we all uh, ready to move to the next question? Yeah, now? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the next question, um, and I'll throw this straight to Charles. We're just starting with marketing and Biomart, not sure how to measure the ROI. Cool. Well, um, for, and look, this, this kind of goes for all campaigns. Um, but for Boma, um, if you go into the campaigns tab, you'll see the recent campaigns that you've sent out. Go in there and you'll be able to actually see whether their email or social media exactly what the ROI was. So you, from an email perspective, that's things like open rate. So the percentage of people, so if you send it to 100 people and 50 people opened your, your email, then your open rate is 50%. Now, a good open rate is anywhere between um, sort of 25 and 40%, or 40% is definitely at the higher end. Um, you know, if you were getting open rates in the sort of 5 to 10, 12%, then you know you might have an issue with your subject line, um, or or maybe there was an issue with, um, you know, maybe not making it engaging enough or interesting enough. From a social perspective, um, or and actually one last thing to add on to um, onto emails is obviously the click through rate. So if you've got a button in there with a call to action saying um, book a time, you know, to speak with me or, or do something like that, you know, what is your click through rate? So again, if you have fifty people open that email and 25% click on that button and, and take that action, then your click-through rate is 50%. Now, obviously, most click-through rates, a good click-through rate is sort of 2 to 5%. Anything above that is really good. If you're sort of in the uh, under 1%, then again, you maybe didn't make it, um, you know, the call to action strong enough. In terms of social, social engagement can be measured on things like how many people liked a post or shared it, uh, impressions is always good, so that's how many people saw it, um, uh, and comments are always interesting as well. Um, another question in terms of, and this I, th I think harks back a little bit to websites, is the question of how long us no users normally stay on a website. Now there is a, um, on, um, in most website uh, platforms like WordPress, for example, you can actually see how much time they spend on every page in your website. Uh, now, depending on what page it is, um, you know, if it's uh, on your blog page, you might expect a slightly higher, uh, I suppose, length of stay because they're, they're reading the entire page. Um, equally, if, you know, it's on a, a lesser known page, maybe they just sort of flick through it and have a quick look and they're, they're out of there in 30 seconds. 
I suppose one thing to look at there is your bounce rate. Um, if your bounce rate is, is high, and, and Tom, you, maybe you could talk about this, then that's really saying that they came on and as soon as they landed on that page, they left it. So that's probably a, a thing to start with, at least for measuring the effectiveness of your pages. Mm. Uh, just on that, the amount of people that don't realize how slow their website loads and then wonder why they've got a high bounce rate is phenomenal. Uh, even if you refer to client, they, when your website takes 15 seconds to load, especially if they don't have good internet, they'll just leave and they'll just go somewhere else and that affects your bounce rate. So if someone's clicked on your website or gone to go to it, that's recorded, but then they just leave straight away. That's how the percentage of people that bounce off your website. Um, and so, yeah, you can track all of that. You can put your website through free tools to say, how fast is my site? You know, all, all those sort of little things that you can just touch up that again, don't really require much investment at all, if any, that you can just check to make sure that everything's working properly. And on Charles' point, uh, something you would be, it would be useful to get really good at tracking is, well, what did someone type to search my business? And then when they came to my website, someone who searched that and then clicked on it, how long did they spend on my website, which you actually can track as well with some free tools from Google. So when you start to get reports like that, it can be quite useful because someone searching for training on QuickBooks or Xero coming to your website, probably want them to spend a little while. You want to give them some education on there, but if they're just coming and going, well, your information is probably not good enough and you need to review it. But someone just coming to your webpage, the amount of clients that will come to your homepage just to look for your phone number because they forgot it. They get it in 10 seconds and leave. You shouldn't think, oh, I'm only getting 10 seconds on my site. You know, so it's kind of different pages have different average times that should be spent on them depending on their purpose. You actually, you have to think about it. And, um, it certainly helps you to target content of use on your website and, and, mm -hmm. and, and what content do your clients and future clients want to digest. That's really important. We might just move along to the next question, Tom. Absolutely. We've got a lot to get through. Um, sure. We do. Okay. How okay. do we so how do we yeah. <laughs> how do we attract <laughs> new clients using social media? Okay. So um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass this over to Tom very shortly. But I, what I am gonna say is that um, marketing needs to have more prongs to it than social media one channel you've got to do more than one channel or else you're going to diss social media so it's not a one channel wonder it's usually as a result of three or four channels coming together nicely so um, we can't just um, hang out on social media and believe that that's actually going to bring us up the future clients we're looking for but Tom I want you to embellish on this and then and then Charles as well yeah, so I look at this as something we can all relate to before COVID, uh, sort of, I think was more common, is if you were to walk into a networking room and not really say anything, but just kind of hang out wearing your T-shirt that has your brand on it, would you expect many people to come over to you and ask for your services? Uh, I think it's quite similar, you know, if you, to social media, because if you walk into a networking room and you engage with people, talk to people, answer their questions, give away value for free and make good quality posts, people will be attracted to you because they get the feeling that not only do you care, which I think is probably the number one thing it shows is we care about giving you the best information possible, but it's also, it shows you're proactive and shows that you're knowledgeable about certain topics and gives you a chance to show that maybe any specializations you have as well. Um, so yes, yeah, same as if you walk into a networking room, do that, you'll get work. If you put on, go on social media and engage with people, you, you can you can get some some of those good touch points in. And they said there's 21 touch points to, to win a client. Um, it's an opportunity to gain those. But if you just sort of go there and go, well, I'm on social media, where are my clients? It's like walking into a big networking room or a conference and saying, well, I'm here and then get any clients out of that, well, obviously, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sure Giles will have more to say about that because their platform makes that so easy for you to do. Uh, but uh, But yeah, that's a good way to think about that, I think. Yeah, look, I think in the interest of time, I'll just make one point, which is um, don't don't think that being social has to be all on one person in your firm. Now, obviously, if you are just a one person firm, then it does fall to you. But if you're a slightly larger firm and there's, you know, four or 10 of you, um, it's not just, you know, the marketing person's role to sort of do all social and be responsible themselves. Every person in that firm is uh, has usually will have access to their own LinkedIn profile, their own Facebook uh, profile, et cetera, X, Twitter. Um, and that's opportunities and channels for you to use 
to get your message out. Now, it could be that, as uh, as Tom pointed out, they're going into those in those communities and, and commenting, um, or it could be that they're posting things that the marketing person provides them, or maybe they they create it themselves. Um, but again, sharing that load um, will be a will be a big benefit. Um, and equally, if your um, if your individual people within your firm, you know, are followed or follow their clients, it's just another great way for sort of them to get their message out in front of individual clients and not just rely on you know, the sort of the uh, Facebook um, business page of, of your firm. It, it brings a much more human element to it. Most definitely. It and that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to Tom now. We're going to kick into the next batch of questions because there's some pretty important content coming through. Perfect. So this next one, um, accounting content ideas for both email and social media. Well, I think Viv and Charles will both have great content in terms of that. So I might hand over to you, Charles, and then Viv, get your opinion on that one as well. Cool. Well, look, I mean, the whole purpose of BOMA um, was to really sort of take that guesswork out. So um, we cover, you know, not just compliance, we cover everything from the softer topics like uh, you know, how to manage stress in the workplace, um, HR, uh, we've got things talking about, you know, uh, holidays and sort of end of financial years. We we also sort of talk about the more business advisory sort of topics, whether it's, you know, tax advisory or, you know, um, managing cash flow. So I suppose the point here is that, you know, if you are, you um, you know, if you do have that sort of content strategy, especially around educational content, then you don't want to be just banging one content topic. You really want to be sort of showcasing the depth and breadth of your expertise. Um, and, you know, and, and hopefully that will also relate to some of the services that you offer. So, you know, think about your, um, think about your clients, think about what's going to interest them. If you do want to put a content sort of plan together, that would be, uh, hugely valuable um, and that could be as little as you know what are we going to talk about this month you know maybe one or two one or two sort of overarching topics and then you can sort of build off some pillars underneath that and that would give your your team some great ideas to mm. just brainstorm off great great Charles um what I will say to you first of all is that um, education marketing um, is uh, really really effective but to to actually implement education marketing, you actually have to educate and you have to go beyond the generic. So I agree with uh, Charles about having a theme for the following month. In fact, I'd back up the truck another month and say, if you're talking about November, you should be planning your, your content theme now in September so that, you, so that you've got it organised in October and out she goes in November. So... Um, you know, think about the issues that impact your clients now. So, for example, you might do a content pathway on on cash flow management, on better cash flow. So, uh, and for example, we've got, uh, just to give you an example of that, you might kick it off with a general subject, what are the seven causes of the cash flow? And then you've got a, a theme, a central theme, and the next piece of content might be the, the first cause of poor cash flow. Now you're kind of hooking them in because it's like they're watching a series and you're building up to how you put these seven causes of poor cash flow together and you're actually providing content of value and you really are educating. So these are the sorts of content pathways that we build here at The Gap and that I know that BOMA have got up on the, on the, on the platform. Uh, so educate, you've got to educate them what's important yeah. to them now. Absolutely, totally agree with that. I might just in the interest of time, move things along quickly now because we've got about 10 minutes left or so. Um, so this one, how can I reach out to prospects and gain new clients? Quite a broad question. Um, I would just jump in and say firstly though, that um, if you're talking about purely outbound strategies, which is how do I find people, reach out, talk to them and convince them to buy, I'd say, why don't you put the lure out and try and attract the right client to your business instead? Um, so less of a scattergun. Approach, Viv. I think you had um, something to weigh in on that as well, quickly, just before. Yeah, you know, yeah. And if we look inbound, um, and remember, it's not all digital. Digital is very important, but it's not all, all, all digital. But a target approach. So get out the um, the watering can, not the fire hydrant. If you get the fire hydrant out, you're going to kill a few plants and you're going to drown a few others. So get the watering can out. So inbound, think about 
who are your referral networks? Who are they? Where do they hang out? Put put some event, put a couple of events together for clients. They can be web-based. It can be a simple webinar, just like we're doing right now. Tons of accounting firms do this. Uh, a small number do it consistently. Uh, and that can be a face-to-face -face event. Once again, educate them. Just It's not just about turning up for a drink. It's got to be an event with a purpose, a central theme, and key takeouts for those people. Now, your existing clients can, can invite their colleagues your uh, uh, influencers and, and networks can invite their customers and clients. And now you've got an inbound strategy. Agreed, yeah. And Charles, did you have anything to jump in on that one for, or did we, did we, should we move on to the next one? No, I think uh, let's move on in the interest of time. Sure. So this next one is, actually, I'm very passionate about this one. Do we think that word of mouth is still as prolific in generating new clients today as it was five years ago? And I'll definitely get Viv to weigh in on this one as well, because I think there's two sides to this. There's what was, you know, five years ago, more strongly, just straight word of mouth, people talking at uh, barbecues, dinners, things like that, saying, I've just got this huge tax bill, my accountant didn't warn me about, who's your accountant? You know, there's that kind of a thing. And now what we're finding is it's moving a lot more online and people are getting referred to different businesses but then they're doing their due diligence and they're looking around to see, well, who else is in the area? What kind of reviews do they have? What do people say about them? So if someone gets referred to you and that's traditional word of mouth, they're now looking at the three local competitors, which you don't really have a choice. Google will show them those competitors because they're typing in your business name to Google, not your URL into the and going directly to your website. So the moment they type your accounting firm in, three others get shown with good quality reviews. So that is electronic word of mouth, is who's being referred online and what are people saying about them? And that is getting more and more and more important uh, today than it was five years ago. Um, but there's still the offline element, which I think, Viv, you had some good comments on this before. When we yeah, were and, yeah, and it's, it's offline and online. First of all, um, word of mouth is just as important. And I'm reminded of Instagram and and, and you, so few words you've got unless you go down into the bio. But, um, you know, think about why people want to buy from you. And as Simon Sinek says, um, people buy, don't, they don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So think about posting about uh, and talking about your purpose and your values and the people, the diversity in your workplace, your workplace culture, um, uh, all of these things that are in, uh, near and dear to you. And also talk to your clients who are referring you and ask them for referrals. They may think you're too busy. Um, and there's lots of ways you can do this elegantly. Put it on your email signature, um, write about it, um, ask for referrals and ask for those referrals from your key networks as well. Tell them you're not closed for business. Tell them you're not too busy to take on new clients because that can be a concern about professional services. Absolutely, definitely. Charles, did you have anything on that one or are you happy to move on? No, let's move on. We promise. We might actually just letting everyone know, we might miss a few questions today, just given the um, timing and we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So but what I can uh, say is that from the three of us, there will almost certainly be blogs coming out answering some of these questions that we have been posed uh, that we haven't actually, if we don't have time to go over them today, so you won't miss out on anything there that will come out. So this next question is, we're keen to hear about how people are integrating AI into their marketing, which is definitely one for Charles, considering he's giving a great talk on this in the upcoming uh, reunion conference that we'll all be at. So Charles, did you have something to, to jump in and talk about there? Yeah, look, just very briefly. I mean, we think it's a great, well, it's an amazing piece of technology. We will be in five years. It's hard to say, but at the moment, we see it as a really amazing tool. Um, but it's a tool with some limitations. And so if we sort of dive down to, you know, and look at it from a content perspective first, look, it can be really helpful. So you were, you know, one of the questions earlier was about, you know, content, you know, the ideas. Well, it can help you brainstorm ideas. Um, you can also feed uh, a blog you've written, you know, you've written and say, check it for spelling mistakes and sort of make sure the tone is this or that. So, you know, it can be really useful as an efficiency driver within your organization. And I know looking at a lot of other accounting software apps, um, the likes of Carbon and Ada, they're all integrating AI, especially from a data perspective. But back on to sort of the marketing side of things and a content one, especially, 
Um, it is, a lot of them are trained on the internet and we know that the internet, there's some amazing stuff and there's also a lot of uh, hunkum sort of bogus stuff out there. So, you know, AI has had, you know, it does get things wrong, it does make things up, um, but it will sound incredibly convincing while it makes things up. So if you are wanting it to say, write a quick Christmas note, which you then sort of put your own voice on top of afterwards, it's fantastic. Would I trust my professional reputation by asking ChatGPT to write um, uh, some information on sort of a tax commentary or some government regulations? No, I probably wouldn't because, you know, unless you're an expert, um, you know, there may be things that are, you know, are not correct in there. And, you know, you, maybe you as the uh, leader of your accounting firm might pick them up. But if you've got maybe a more junior person, maybe someone who's not um, trained in accounting, they'd read it, think it all sounds great, and then just send it out. So, you know, be careful. So again, we see it as a great tool um, that, uh, you know, that will help your efficiency gains. Um, but if you're sort of looking for, you know, deep expertise, whether it's in, you know, uh, you know, topics like the gap covers in terms of, you know, moving to that more business advisory, getting new clients, or it's sort of tax, um, then, you know, I would rely on those sort of editors who can cast, a, you know, a professional lens over it rather than the kind of black box AI who we don't really know, you know, how they're delivering the results uh, until maybe it is too late and you've sent that email out and, and whoops. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, totally. Certainly going to be careful about that. Well, I think that's just a bit of a teaser to what we're all going to get. Well, everyone who has tickets to the upcoming uh, conference will all be at in New Zealand run by the GAP reunion. Um, but I think I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk in, in full about how to really properly leverage AI into your marketing as well, Charles. I'm really looking forward to that. That would be excellent. Yeah, I mean, my, I my key... Go through... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Viv. I was going to jump forward. But you start, that. <laughs> start, start with reliable content throw it into an AI tool to rewrite it in your voice uh, and to change the content up a bit, but start with reliable content and I wouldn't be starting at ChatGPT for that. No, definitely not. And you can get some, uh, just, I mean, maybe from a Google's perspective, even Google's looking for new content. Uh, so whether it's AI or not, they want a new perspective on it. So as Viv said, start writing yourself, give a bit of a perspective. You can even do that in dot points and then use it to tidy that up. So this next question, I'm used to big marketing teams with big budgets and a large number of customers. How do I easily identify opportunities for quick wins that can be actioned by one person? So that's a, that's a really good question because it's, you know, what can I do as a small operator to compete with some of these big guys? Uh, Viv, did you have anything to jump in with on that one with to start off? Well, the first thing I do is have have a simple marketing plan and a simple marketing plan. Get it on one page. It's probably one to two goals, no more, and maybe three strategies, no more, and and do them well, constant and consistent. Keep rolling it over. So a couple of simple strategies. Um, hang out some with some good referral partners where they look after clients of the type that you're looking for. Build the relationship. Don't take them out for lunch once and expect it to grow from there. Get them to come to your events. Get them to come and meet your team. Have a bit of a boardroom briefing where you talk about what you do is special as a firm. So if that's your strategy, then you need to water and feed these people. It'll be six months before you get any green shoots from that. If you're not prepared to do that, don't do it at all. Second thing I'd do, I would definitely execute some sort of educational event strategy. Start with a simple webinars, do something every month, be known for the firm that educates, be original, execute it well, constant and consistent. Get the watering can out. Yeah, get the watering can out. Charles, did you have anything to add to that as well? Oh, look, I'll just re reiterate um, Viv's, you know, be consistent and execute well. And I think in a lot of things in life, if you do those, uh, it'll take care of itself. Absolutely. Yeah, wonderful. I think uh, just to add two things that I've seen people do really well that take not much time to set up is start tracking your leads. You'll be surprised where they actually come from and the value that referrers are bringing you so you can rank that and get a report on that each year. Um, and probably the other thing is start asking clients for referrals and reviews online. You'd be surprised how many clients come through and say, well, I saw you had great reviews online once you've got 20, 30, 40 reviews up there on Google. 
So moving forward, we might do this as sort of our, or maybe we should move to the last question now before you just yeah. run up. Uh, and, uh, and I think that last question is, what is the best way to market accounting services? I mean, that's a very broad question. So that kind of summarizes everything today. Viv, what did you have to say about that one? Well, once again, constant and consistent. Start with a plan. Write it down. Have a plan. Um, keep the number of strategies you do small. Do one thing well over and over and over again. Google reviews, very, very important. The first thing people do to do due diligence on you is go to your website and look at reviews. Um, second thing is be very targeted about the sort of client you want and make sure that's well reflected in your website so you don't spend any downtime kicking out um, tire kickers out of the game. Um, and the third thing I would do is educate. Um, so provide value before you extract value. The return will come. Educate well, not generic crappy content, good content from good sources. We're not the only source for that. And, um, and back that education up with some simple events and the content's all there for you to do it. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks and for referrals, that, and, and referrals. Referrals, that's right. <laughs> and Charles, what would your comments be for overall the best way to market accounting services? Yeah, look, I think, you know, having those foundations set up is absolutely critical. So, you know, number one foundation is, is having a plan and that's, you know, both what you're going to do, but also understand exactly who you are wanting to reach in terms of ideal clients and where they are. Website, absolutely critical. As Viv said, it's, you know, where people will always go and check you out. Plus, it's a great channel for you to own online. And as one of the questions that came through during this event said, you know, you can both um, target people locally uh, through your website in terms of SEO keywords, but also by services you offer and industries. Um, yeah, great content is key, relevant, educational, um, as you hit upon, uh, both of you hit upon testimonials and reviews, make sure that you are social um, and then obviously think about those non-online uh, events. So it might be, sorry, those non-online activities. So it might be events. These might be ones that you run. They might be ones like a, a local business association that you go and speak at, or maybe you just go there and make and build those relationships with um, people in your industry that you'd like to uh, get in front of. Absolutely. And I would just uh, uh, summarize by saying, I think um, we all know that there's what you say to these people that you're targeting, there's who you target, so who those people are. And, and then once you've sort of defined that, you go, well, how am I going to reach out to these people? And I think the thing to note that summarizes all of this is the research says there's on average 21 touch points you have to make with a customer before they're comfortable to convert to a client of yours. So don't try and shortcut it because you're doing yourself a disservice by doing that. So giving good quality content that goes out regularly, attracting people by putting good quality content that gets ranked and searched for on Google as well will bring people into your website. And I'm reminded of, um, I'm not sure if anyone knows Zig Ziglar, the supposedly greatest salesman that ever listed, uh, ever existed. You know, he just always says, you can have everything you want in the world if you just help enough other people get what they want in the world. So if you put that behind all of your marketing and help first, then you'll start to get results in leaps and bounds. So just summarizing here in terms of taking control of your marketing, um, today you've heard from obviously Viv from The Gap, uh, myself from Better Marketing Results and Charles from BOMA. I'm just going to hand off to firstly Viv to just summarize uh, what she spoke about today and how you can get in touch with her if you'd like to chat further. Well, just just uh, drop me an email. Uh, go to our website and have a have a wee look, of course. Um, we've got quite a few gap firms on the line here today. We know you don't have a lot of a heap of time to write content. We've got hundreds of articles, um, good deep articles, content pathways up on the um, the BOMA uh, platform. And of course, we've got about 30 different events that you can run with your clients. Way to go, everything written for you. Um, so um, don't have to make, you don't have to make it all yourself. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you do need to look at content that is well-written and good quality. That's enough on me. Um, Charles. Thanks, yeah. So look, likewise, um, 
Uh, you can find us at bowmanmarketing.com. You can get a, uh, a live demo or you can watch one for yourself. Obviously sign up for the free trial. Now, obviously we partnered with Better Marketing Results and, and The Gap. So if it comes to uh, having the Gap content of Boma, it's all completely accessible from the Gap portal. Um, and the nice thing is we've got complimentary content, both from our specialist writers, but also writers from the likes of Walters Kloa, Tradeify, um, Vend, and Spotlight Reporting. So again, each uh, you know with deep expertise in their areas. And you know, um, given that you can send it out this content to your blog. Uh, to your um, to your email database and to your social channels, I think it's a it's a very neat um, it's a neat platform to sort of really help you get the most from your marketing, especially if you have as some as some of you alluded to some of those resourcing um, and budget constraints. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, Charles. And um, and on that, you'll probably you'll see Charles at the upcoming reunion conference by the Gap if you're going to that, and see Viv and myself there as as well. So if you have any tickets, definitely jump onto that. But I'll just say to finish off that um, yeah, uh, from better marketing results perspective, something that we're um, happy to give out is you know some of the things that popped up today. I've just thought about is how do you track your existing clients? Well, we have templates for that. I'll share that for free if anyone wants a template to track where their leads come from and make it really easy for from them. Uh, for them and probably the other thing that we talked about was reviews and developing reviews online and how you do that so we have a system and a process and a, and a software that does that while giving you a chance to respond to any negative reviews privately first so you don't have to worry about what are people going to say about me online so there's really good systems and procedures and email templates in place for that which we're actually giving out for free on a free trial. So you'll get a survey uh, after the, after this uh, after this webinar just about uh, BOMA, about better marketing results and about the gap. So feel free to let us know if there's any contact you'd like us to make with you after that. And I think probably that you'll see some of these questions pop up in more detail in uh, blogs that we ourselves might write up uh, sticking to exactly what we recommend you do. We'll do the same thing ourselves. So thank you for your time, everyone, today. Was there any other comments, Charles or Viv, that you wanted to add before we finish up? No, nothing add, further to add, but I just want everyone to note the, the lovely touch from Tom at the end. Um, give value before you extract value. So Tom's got a couple of free templates there for you. And so that's a beautiful example of education marketing, really nice one. Mm. Look, and I would, um, in, in the exit survey, uh, it's also, um, if you can take the time to put out, there's a question in there in terms of the three actions that you're going to take. So our, our bit to sort of help uh, hold you accountable, obviously, to yourselves um, and also um, the value that you found from this to help us, obviously, fine tune uh, future presentations and, and webinars for you. But yeah, thank you so much all for joining. Thank you. Wonderful. Have Thanks a great everyone, afternoon. And uh, see you all later. Thanks.